thank you everyone for joining the webinar um, wherever you are in the world because we understand this is going out globally. Um, the webinar around the art of coaching uh, with our special guest this evening who I'll introduce short, shortly. Um, so my, just to introduce myself first, my name's Paul Bright. I am the technical director for the coaching manual and, to, and today's uh, webinar is being brought to you by the coaching manual Dot com along with sensiblesoccer.co.uk, uh, Twitter handle at SoccerLTD. Um, and, you know, we're really privileged this evening to have um, a manager and former player who, who has experienced all levels of the game as well. Um, we are targeting and, and asking our um, attendees to make voluntary donations uh, to raise money for our fantastic uh, national healthcare system, our NHS in the UK. We have set up a Just Giving page, um, and if you search TCM or the coaching manual, um, you'll be able to navigate there and, and make any voluntary donations that you wish. And also, just to add to that, obviously, with, with our guest connections with uh, Manchester United Football Club and the fantastic work that they are doing in supporting the NHS and the appreciation packages delivered to the NHS staff. Uh, the Manchester United Foundation um, are providing a vehicle fleet and drivers on duty for NHS use. Club staff, both within the club and within the Manchester United Foundation, are continuing to support key workers um, within the NHS and their children. And Sir Alex Ferguson, former Manchester United manager, current Manchester United manager Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and club captain Harry Maguire have all uh, praised the magnificent work and response from our fantastic NHS. So we're pleased to be able to support um, the NHS this evening through those voluntary donations. So thank you very much. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to start by introducing our guest. And what we will say is um, our guest Mike has as kindly said, we can answer any uh, questions at the end. We'll do a Q&A at the end. Um, and this webinar will be recorded and put on the coachingmanual.com. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike Phelan. Uh, Mike's playing background with over 485 professional appearances. That, that's resulted in over 100 appearances for Burnley, Norwich City, Manchester United. Um, and, and West Bromwich Albion, uh, former England international. And in terms of, you know, uh, honours as a player, Premier League, FA Cup, League Cup, European Cup Winners' Cup with Manchester United, along with Football League third division titles with Burnley and second division title with Norwich City. That's only the start because obviously Mike's, Mike's pursued an active role as a coach and as a manager at the highest levels of the game. Uh, so that, that's resulted in assistant manager roles at, at Norwich City, Blackpool and Stockport County, reserve team and manager and first team coach at Manchester United, obviously assistant manager at Manchester United under Sir Alex Ferguson, caretaker manager role at Norwich City and first team manager role at Hull City, sporting director at Central Coast Mariners and that really takes us up to Mike's current uh, positions as assistant manager at Manchester United Football Club and director and chairman at sensiblesoccer.co.uk. So a very long introduction, Mike, but, uh, you know, absolutely privileged and honoured to, to have you on this evening or, or this afternoon, wherever we are in the world, and really share your experiences. So welcome. You're more than welcome. It's good to be here. Brilliant. So obviously this evening, Mike, we're looking at covering, you know, the art of coaching and, and you've been kind enough to send through some slides and, and some um, information that I'll show periodically through the presentation. But first off, what we'd like, like to start with is where it all began for you, both as a player and then your journey into coaching. Obviously, being a, a Burnley lad, um, football, it plays a very prominent role in, in, in the town of Burnley. So, really, if you could share with the audience how your love of the game developed, first as a player, and then obviously moving on into a coaching and managerial role. Well, football always starts when you're a young kid and you, uh, you get that ball thrown at you and you take to it straight away. I was fortunate enough to have a little bit of a gift, which was being able to kick that ball around. So 
very early I started off at a local boys club and uh, and then that progressed obviously through the ranks of your town teams, your schools and then into your county setup. And that's when you get involved in in being scouted like most most kids. Um, that obviously then resulted in me joining my local my local football club, which was Burnley Football Club. And it progressed from there as a player. You know, apprenticeships in them days were were part of of work and play really. You had to learn the basics both on and off the field. And that then took me onto a, a career path of of football and, and and it was a good career path on from Burnley to Norwich, Norwich to Man United, Man United to West Brom and then back to Norwich. So so it was yeah, it was an interesting journey for me. Coaching wise, it all came to an end a little bit abruptly. I was starting to get injuries as you do in football. You get a little bit older and a little bit wiser. And then it was a case of, you know, do I really want to go into coaching? I always had an idea about coaching. I was always interested even when I was playing, you know, listening to to coaches talk, listening to uh, all the all the elements really of of how you go around organising training sessions and things like that. So for me, it became a, a natural progression in in going into coaching. Obviously, from that you have to gain experience and get your badges in order to to continue coaching. So it was uh, it was really interesting, and, and along that journey being around some very, very good coaches, some really good coaches that, that sort of helped me blossom and, and helped me create the career that I've had. Fantastic. Um, you, you actually mentioned it there about having, you know, having an idea that as a, even as a player you wanted to, to go into potentially having a look at coaching and management. Um, d- during your playing career, were, were you encouraged to, to actively, you know, assess and analyse games or was that something that some players naturally picked up others went about performing the role and that was it for the end of the day I think it started really whilst you're a player you get to that certain point in your in your career as a player where you have an opinion you have an opinion about the game you have an opinion about how you want the game to be played and it's just an extension then that you can you can really dig a little bit deeper and, and start asking questions. The important thing was to ask questions. And I was fortunate enough in my career, both at, both at Burnley with good coaches and at Norwich with good coaches, that they were quite open. They were really open about why we were doing things as players, why we were doing things as a team. And it was a case for me to, to just gain all that, that knowledge and then really dissect it in my own way, pick my own my own sort of style and my own way as to how I would want to coach uh, going forward. And, and in, ter- in terms of gaining formal qualifications, because, you know, we feel now that there's so much work being done by national governing bodies and coaches are really encouraged. Even players now are encouraged doing, doing their own, you know, YTSs and apprenticeships to, to get on the ladder of coaching early. What, what was your pathway in terms of introduction to formal coaching qualifications and how did you find those experiences? I, I started I started early and got what was then the B license right at the beginning. Uh, that was just you know a couple of weeks of learning from the coaches and then sort of relaying back what the coaches had already given you you know as, as an insight into coaching. Then you moved up to the A license which is a little bit more structured, a little bit more detail and it requires you know quite a lot of attention, quite a lot of attention. And that's on and off the field. But then whilst you're playing, you start to analyse the games a little bit more. And in my time early on, yeah, a lot of it was a little bit different because it was more paper, more diagrammatic, um, that type of thing, rather than actually on the screen sort of uh, analysis. But you quickly picked it up because there was a lot of people who wanted to give you information. And if you were willing to listen, you would gain a lot of knowledge quickly. And then you just have tried to apply it. And, and, and that's the way, the way I started, through qualifications, but then getting out there and at the lower levels or at junior level or, or just in the general park, you know, with a group of young lads, just try and put yourself across as a, as a, as a potential coach and, and, and do a few drills and a few things, you know, and, and just listen to your own voice, you know, because your voice is different when you hear it you know, how you translate that voice, how does that come across to, to the people you're coaching? So all that was a, 
an early learning curve or a good learning curve. Did you feel that obviously your your outstanding playing experiences? Did did you feel that give you a bit of advantage as well stepping in to that coaching arena, or was it a case of this is completely different to playing and you know I need to start from scratch? It did. It did sort of give me confidence because you know when you when you're playing and you're playing at the level that you're playing at, there's a lot of tension, a lot of pressure, a lot of a lot of sort of. Uh, appreciation for what you're doing so you take that out onto the training ground and you try and be confident it's not easy because it is different you're addressing different people you know you are that person um, on, a, on a football field when the coach is talking to you but now you're the coach you're the guy they're listening to yeah. so it's important that you try and communicate those ideas uh, across to, to whoever you're coaching whatever level you're coaching at as quickly as you can and also gain gain their trust gain their trust and their bit of respect that that they understand and appreciate what you're trying to do fantastic and we'll, we'll move on to obviously your early years as a coach and i'm just going to share one of your slides what you sent through if you don't mind mike because i thought this was you know as a coach myself i I was looking at this and thought some absolutely fantastic words here. But if you can just obviously dive into your early years as a coach as well, and you've got some key words up there that I'll let you talk around and, and how important those early years, you know, cutting your teeth and, and, and getting grass under your under your boots, as we, we tend to call it, how, how important that was in terms of... I mentioned that coaching in those small, small sort of words, really, but... I suppose they, they escalate into bigger words the, the further up the coaching ladder you go. But I always felt as though, as a player, I, I would like to start coaching the players as I would like to be coached. So it's more or less taking some of the coaching situations that you've been put through back out onto the field to see how people react to it. So I was, I was very, very open, really, and, 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 and really learning on my feet. To, uh, to try and get that message across. And, and I was observing as well, you know, those, those words are there, but I was observing the reaction of those people, no matter what age groups I was, I was coaching, what, what was happening uh, with those people, how did they take in that information? Um, and then letting it go, really, letting them encourage me to do more. Um, and and, and that, that way I felt as though I was part of this growing experience that I was trying to get in those early years and obviously depending then where you pitch and you, you then move into the professional coaching setup it's it's slightly different because then you do have to gain that respect yes you can give a little bit of knowledge back but you also have to be organized you have to definitely know how to organize certain sessions be it individual collective groups um, but that comes you know that that comes by being accepted by those players and you know for most of the time they do listen yep. and other times they switch off you know you can't you can't uh, always get that message through to everybody at the professional level but you just hope that if that message goes into one or two players then that carries a bit of meaning within the group and, and it starts to grow one word I'm, I'm going to pick up on here uh, Mike if you don't mind is is mistakes and obviously the game is so dynamic and and at the top level, you know, you're under the spotlight 24-7, never mind when, when you're dealing with a, a youth team or a group of kids and you're under the spotlight with the parents looking on. Um, how important is it for, for coaches to be open to, to trying things, to experimenting and to accepting that? Listen, we're not going to get it right every time. Yeah, I think, that's, I think it's hugely important that you, you try to do something which isn't always correct. But through trying it and trying to appreciate what you, what you are trying to feed into players, that you're going to make mistakes. The big thing is in making mistakes is analysing them afterwards. Be honest, be open, you know, open to discussion. Sometimes, you know, that at the professional level, it is good to ask the players what they think of that session. You know, and it's also good to ask them to really add something to it. You know, the challenge is... Uh, at the level I, I coached at is giving information and knowing how they interpret that information. You can see it with your eyes, you can hear it, but you really want them to buy into what you're trying to do for them. It's really important that they 
grasp what you're trying to give them and then for them to try and do it you know so there's mistakes not only on the coach's part but there'll be mistakes from a player's part as well but that's all part of the learning curve and then obviously you you try and lessen those mistakes but mistakes make you a better person they do make you think a little bit harder than sometimes all the good things that happen brilliant um, just for all the attendees that are joining us, obviously, um, webinar on the art of coaching with Mike Phelan brought to you with thecoachingmanual.com and sensiblesoccer.co.uk. Um, and we are asking for voluntary donations for our fantastic NHS um, service on the Just Giving page if you search TCM or the coaching manual. So just a quick plug again, just to encourage uh, <laughs> people, Mike. So yeah, uh, we'll move on. Um, and, and again, you've, you've been involved in, in developing players at all levels of the game for a number of years now and seeing those players come to fruition from, you know, from, from boys into, into men and into professionals who are playing at the highest level. What, what is, do you have a process in terms of how you see these players developing into young and then established professionals? And, and you know, what are the key traits as a coach to develop players in at the highest levels of the game? I think it's important to relate to the players because nowadays players come from different cultures, different backgrounds. They've all got their own sort of agendas, you know, and you've got to try and get to know those players both individually and collectively in order yeah. to, to, to get that translation across. You know, football is, is pretty common. It doesn't matter what language you're talking. Most footballers understand uh, how to play the game. It's just yeah. a case of how do you how do you put those jigsaw puzzles together in order to make them better. Now, there's a combination of things there, which is obviously communication. Then there's obviously the, uh, the way that you're going to get that message across. That's really, really important. And then really, you've got to let them grow. You've got to let them accept certain things. And then you've got to let them really experiment and be patient with them. Patience is not an easy word these days in football, I must admit, but, but it, it's got to be done. From a young player's point of view, yes, there are different learning strategies for them, uh, but the expectation is still the same. You want them to do well. You really want them to, to create momentum in their, in their ability to learn and then to translate that from the training ground onto the football field. And then you've got the blend. You've got the blend of youth and experience and you know maybe that little bit of flair you know that player that is slightly different slightly off the off the curve sort of thing not generally you know at the lower part of it not at the high end the one that will take risks so it's learning as a coach to blend all those things and be available for all those different players to feedback to give information to help them grow because as much as i don't have all the answers they don't either they play the game, but sometimes the players only play the game. They don't think the game. Again, you know, I, I demonstrated the slide there and some fantastic, you know, ideas and, and processes there. You touched on it there at the end, but in terms of feedback, how important is feedback for players at all levels? Not, not just the, the young children learning the game, but even you know, these professionals who are playing week in, week out at the highest level, how important is that feedback to those players? I think it's huge. And I think it's huge at all levels. And at junior level and, and, and sort of amateur level, I think everybody wants to be appreciated for, for what they're trying to do, what they're trying to achieve. Obviously, the more you go into coaching and the deeper you get into it, the feedback is, is, is something that you give as and when it's needed or when you feel it's needed and, and that can range for a lot of different things because some players can take on information differently you know some need it need to be shown it some need to be have it written down so that it's 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 there some need it verbally it's it's finding out those what makes those people tick what 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 can they take on board which isn't too much but it can improve them because all players, top players in particular, they want more and more. They, they're sponges. They want, they want everything you can give them. And they will drain you dry. They will definitely drain you dry. And, and it's also good as a coach to actually accept sometimes you can't give them everything because you haven't got everything. But you can find ways of doing that. So it's relationships. 
it's relationships throughout those groups. So for me, yeah, it's 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 in, it's really important how you get that message across, how you translate that message. You talked about relationships and 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 going off the back of feedback, and and you're looking at the current club. You you operate at Manchester United. You held various roles at the club. Why do you think then, in terms of player development, Manchester United have consistently produced? professional footballers if you look at the stats you know the number of academy graduates coming through Manchester United who earn a career in the game are, are those relationships valued highly at the club all the way through and is is the process you've just talked about paramount through the club do you think yeah I, th I think what's what I learned along the coaching journey is there's always a team behind a team and the yeah. team of people that are now in the game are vitally important to service those football players they demand that and at every level I've coached at and particularly at Manchester United the attention to detail is paramount and that's individually and and collective really and the message is pretty consistent everybody who wants to join Manchester United joins because they want to leave something a legacy behind which is achievement and that's the most important thing and coaches want to be able to facilitate that so there's a lot of areas at Manchester United that every player at that club gets attention and the right attention at all levels so that when they finally pass through the system from academy through into the to what you could call the youth and then beyond that into the professional environment they understand the culture the culture of the club and at Manchester United the culture is there for everybody to see if you're good enough if you're old enough you know, and it doesn't matter at what age. And yeah. if you're showing those progressions and those traits that you can handle that and you're a better person for it, because we do we do push the, you know, we want better people all the time, not just good footballers, but better people, then eventually you'll have a career in the game. And that's that's an important thing as a coach. You want players, whether they're young, older, or you know, more mature, you want them to have a career in the game. And that is a difficult pathway, a real difficult one. But yeah. if they put the time and the effort in and they listen and they want to learn and they have an open mind and they can put all those things together, then there's plenty of examples at Manchester United that have made that career path all the way through. And I still consider it a career. It's not just a job, it's a career. And, uh, and that goes for both coaches and players. Fantastic. Um... We'll, we'll move on in terms of um, the next question. And you've been involved in the game for a number of years, both as a player, as a coach, as a manager, uh, as a director. How have you seen the, the game develop over the years in terms of coaching now, in terms of the evolution of coaching uh, to get to the point we're currently at? Because there's been, a, there's been a huge shift even in the last five years from, from what I can see. So how have you seen it at, at the top levels? It's shifting day by day, really. You know, there's a, lot, there's a lot going on in the game now. One thing that has changed over the years is definitely uh, relationships with departments. A lot of departmentalisation now at the uh, at football clubs, particularly at the top end, and I and I do believe at amateur level, everybody has a place in a in an amateur football club in order to produce their best for that club. But certainly at the higher level, you know, a coach now is surrounded by groups of people. You know, we've got analysts, we've got sports science, which is a major player now in in football. Um, We've got medical now, which is, you know, top of the tree, really, uh, as far as Premier League clubs go. And I'm sure it's, it's siphoned its way down through, through the, the lower leagues. Um, so it is evolving on a, on a daily basis. The biggest thing for a coach now, with all that, is how you join it all together. What is important or what is more important than something else? Is it all important? But somebody has to bring that together. Uh, and that is the job of either management or the coach and certainly going higher up at the senior level, you know, at the, uh, at the, at the height of the club, the, the people that run the club. So it's all got to be coordinated now. So there is not just an evolution of the coach. There's an evolution of football. You know, it is moving on and it moves on rapidly. It doesn't wait for anybody. And players, players change that. Change, uh, you know, 
players evolve going forward. They make you a better coach sometimes because if you're lucky enough to come across players that really challenge you, you know, and I've been fortunate enough to to be to have been involved with those players, the Ronaldos and the Sebastian Verons and the Wayne Rooney's of this world and and many more of the current crop of players now at Manchester United, they definitely challenge you as a coach because if you can't deliver for them, they quickly turn off. And uh, it's important that you're ahead of the curve all the time and you're, you're always pushing and pressurising yourself and the players to do more. So the game, the game evolves all the time. We're in a period of time now where we're all reflecting because we have you know, a little bit of isolation. You don't normally get much of that when you're on it 24-7, seven, seven days a week at the top end. But it is refreshing. So you can, you can have a little look at how you can improve things. And, Believe you me, when everybody starts going back to, to the football clubs, there'll be massive new ideas suddenly within that first week of being back. Yeah. Everybody, hell, I've done some research, well, I've done some, some extra curriculum work, and it'll be, it'll be buzzing. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%, Matt. I think, you know, the period of reflection that everybody's got, and you look at the very the sharp end of the game, I'd call it, is you're forever moving forwards and staying ahead of everyone else and yourself and your players. Um, but now we've all got that opportunity to reflect and, and it's exciting as well when we do finally get back, hopefully sooner rather than later. Just looking at the evolution of coaching, though, and, and you mentioned earlier the culture of Manchester United and the club, and you know I'm, I'm privy to, to the culture within the club myself. Um, how important is it, though, that those core values still run through? The, does the core values, do, do they ever change you know, in terms of... Of what the game that I've, I've been involved with, I've always tried to understand what what is that culture of that club, because you know, I live in, and I always have lived in the the northwest of England, so there are a lot of football clubs in the northwest of England, all vying for you know being the best team that they can be, but they all bring something different. You can go fifteen miles, ten miles from Burnley. You've got Blackburn, then you've got Bury, and you, well, you had Bury, and then you've got you've got your Manchester clubs a little bit further on. You've Liverpool to this world. Yeah. They've all got something special about who they are. They're all different. They are definitely culturally different. And I think if you can buy into that pretty early, then you understand also then what the supporters' relationship is with their clubs, and what do you have to give to those supporters to make it work for them. So, you know, the identity of Manchester United is attacking, flair, get bums off seats, you know, be exciting, score goals. You know, when they don't feel as though they're getting that, because that's their history, then, you know, as a coach, you're not doing the correct things. You're not appealing to the Manchester United way. And that's massively important. And that's also important with recruitment. You recruit for those supporters. They demand that they see Manchester United play. When I was at Norwich, they demand the Norwich way. You know, we talk about other football clubs. You know, Burnley were completely different. Look at the town. You know, the town relies on its football club, and right now it's flying high. Superb. Manchester United's demand is to entertain, to play attractive football, to score goals, to win football matches, to win leagues. You know, it's a completely different, a different vibe at Manchester United. But that's, as a coach, that is what you've got to translate to the players, what it means to win. Unfortunately, you know, when you have won a few things, you know, like you mentioned at the start, you can pass on that experience of winning, you know, and the hard work that goes into winning. Because everybody sees that winning game or that final or that one moment that they remember in a season. But for a coach, it's an ongoing process. It happens every day and it evolves and you tinker with it and you play with it. And the joy is at the end when you achieve something and you feel as though you achieve it together. It's a, it's, it's a great feeling, a really, really good feeling. But there's a lot of work goes into to yeah. that achievement. If you can, you know, it's all degrees of success. Yeah. Um, great stuff, Mike. So, again, thanks to all the attendees for joining. Another plug. Um, thanks for Mike Phelan, obviously sensiblesoccer.co.uk and thecoachingmanual.com. Um, privileged and honoured for Mike to join us. We are 
asking for voluntary donations um, on our Just Giving page for our fantastic NHS service. If you search TCM or the coachingmanual.com, and all donations for our fantastic NHS are welcome. Um, I'm just going to stay for a bit longer on the evolution of coaching, Mike, because yeah. you've already mentioned some of the players. Obviously, you had the had the privilege to work with first time people like Cristiano Ronaldo, Wayne Rooney coming through to the club, and then the young boys coming, Marcus Rashford, and then Mason Greenwood being one of the you know newest debutants of the club who's been there since he was seven years old. Um, how do you think all of those systems with the evolution of coaching, along with the club culture, have have those systems directly influenced and supported that development path for those players, do you believe? Yeah, I do believe that. I do believe that. I mean, coaches do come and go within the system. Yeah. But I think stability is, is important because with stability, those coaches can provide uh, some kind of emotional emotional. Uh, well-being in a way you know because familiarity is good to some degree when you're younger because they, you build up that trust you build up that reputation and you can be a second parent to, to those young players because you know they come into your care we take them on and we try to bring them through the system to be better people and also to be better football players so I think it's really important relationships I think it's slightly different at academy level and, and, and then moving into that sort of youth rank. But certainly higher up, you're judged on certainly results. But I think you have to take a back seat sometimes as a coach and where everybody else is losing their heads and losing their mind because one result's not, not getting any better or, or you're losing this game and that game. I think as a coach, you have to put it into perspective that you're hoping you're in it for the long haul and you can keep evolving those players and you can keep evolving yourself. But once in a while, you know, I was, I was involved with Sir Alex Ferguson and those players that you, you talked about. The one thing about Sir Alex Ferguson was he gave you the opportunity to coach. His longevity was excellent. You know, 20 odd years at one football club, probably never be repeated again in, in the grand scheme of football these days. But what it did, it gave you an element of security to actually work at your job, work at it, learn with it, uh, develop, and, and also a continuity of players that you could work with, you know, and, and some very, very good players at that. We mentioned some of the top of the tree there, but there's a lot of other players there that all brought something to the, to the training ground, both as people and as players. So you could coach them, you know, the foreign players brought so many different challenges to you. You know, and, and how do you create an individual player into a team player? Ronaldo sticks out quite well there. You know, I always felt through coaches, not just myself, but other coaches at Manchester United who were around Cristiano, he was like a sponge. He wanted more. He challenged you for more. But you had to try and get Cristiano to be a team player. And it, he got it. He did get it. There were certain things we did in training which, which made him you know, do things which he didn't really want to do. But eventually when the success came and then he moved on, particularly to Real Madrid, there were certain things when you observe games he plays at Real Madrid that he definitely picked up at Manchester United. And he was translating that, you know, further up the, the, the ladder of, of excellence, really. Um, so that's important. And there's a, there's a satisfaction, you know. I don't claim to have created Cristiano Ronaldo. That's one thing I wouldn't do. Because there's a lot of people influence Cristiano, but the biggest influence has been himself. His drive has been fantastic, and there's other players as well. Fantastic. And and you mentioned um, then about evolving, you know, and in, in improving yourself as well. You, you've held numerous roles at, at the highest levels of the game. Um, how? What are the keys to that improvement to be able to be sustainable and not just be sustainable, but be successful at the highest levels of the game? Um, <laughs> strong backbone, broad shoulders. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, every, listen, everybody can do it better than, than the person doing it at the time. That's that's a fact in football because everybody has an opinion. So yeah. you know, on on a on a day to day, match day basis, whatever, everybody who sits there and watches football is a perfectionist, they want more. And that's good. But I think from my point of view as a coach, 
developing is is massive. You have to you have to look to improve. You have to go outside of yourself sometimes to to find out what's going on outside of your own football club. And that, what I mean by that is find out what is going on in other sports because other sports can relate to things in football. Um, you know, I'm quite interested in in, in in ice hockey. I don't understand the game, but there are movements in ice hockey which are are relative to maybe a shooting session or you know a finishing session. So you can find these little little things. You know, what what can you improve on from a fitness aspect? Get out there, ask people. You know, listen to things. Um, don't be shy. Ask questions. You know, we all feel as though sometimes. We don't need to ask questions because we've got all the answers. But believe you me, we haven't. You know, there's always areas of learning um, and not necessarily in football that you can bring to the game. So I think it's, that's, that's a key to improvement, really, on a personal basis. And, and, and also, the roles that I've had, I, I quite like to create groups of people who can interact and, 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 and try and experiment and grow. And, 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 and also ask me questions and through experience and a little bit of knowledge for them to go away and maybe I've reinforced their beliefs, you know, because that's how I, I, I learned through listening to people and, and translating what I'm listening to into the way I was thinking. And, and sometimes it gives you a little bit of a G up, a little bit of confidence to, to know that you're on the right track. So those roles that I've had, they've all encompassed that thing. And, I, you know, I like to to understand and talk to people and find out what is it that I can do or help to make them better. You know, and that's, that's, that's not just football players. That's, that's other coaches or other areas of your football club. So it's bringing people together and yeah. having a go really. So touching on that then, how, how important is it to surround yourself with good people and, and build that network? And like you said, those people may not even be involved within your own sport. They may work beside you on a day to day. Is, is that an important part of being successful at the top level, surrounding yourself with good, good people? I think your experiences along your journey, bringing contact with a lot of good people. I mean, there's a lot of good people in work, in football, and there's a lot of good football people out of work. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. But I think as you grow, you, you mix with people that you feel comfortable with from the point of view of you are, you are in the game because it is all absorbing. It takes up so much of your time. So you do surround yourself with people you feel comfortable with, and you have to because you more or less live in each other's pockets. You know, you live in hotels now, you're traveling all the time, you're playing in Europe, so you're on the journey. You're then back at your training ground, so your hours are precious. And you spend a lot of those hours with those people that you need to make it work, make your coaching job and make those players better. So yeah, you, you are choosy, but you've also got to have those dynamics within the group which are slightly eccentric or different yeah. challenge you yourself you know if you don't want people that always nod and say yes how you doing and and what a lovely morning it is today when it's not you need the people to just <laughs> look you in the eye and tell you straight that this isn't working we need to look at it differently so it's it's getting the right amount of people and the right combinations of people and then hopefully you can breed that culture and that success and you can relay that back to the uh, to the players Brilliant. And, and how, how, how much does pressure play into that strive to, to be ahead of the game and, and continuing to develop and improve? Because you know, most of your roles have been at the top level, at the sharp end of the game. Is, is that pressure there or is it a case of it's more for myself and for the people around me in the club I, I work with to stay ahead of the game? Or is it a mixture of, of everything? I think it's a mixture of everything. I think in the early... The early part of the coaching, you want to prove your worth. You want to prove that you can do this. And you want to prove that to other people probably more than yourself sometimes. I think that's human nature. You want to be accepted. I think as you do it more and more and you gain more experience and you've coached for a long time, you can, you can sort of separate the pressure from the job, from the work that you're doing. And you understand that it's always there at the 
the back of your mind that you want to keep progressing, you want to keep learning, you want to keep giving the information to the players and be around the players in a football club. That's not always the case, but you try to avoid the pressure moments. But then they do come. They do come through at the highest level, results and progress. Are you making pro progress throughout the division? Are you challenging for honours and things like that? But, but then you, it's a slightly different thing then because you have a will to win, but you rely quite a lot on the players as a coach. The coach can give only so much information. The players have to take that on board, mix it up with their ambitions and then deliver it on the football field. So you, you become a bit reliant on the players. So the more good players you have and the more you can blend them together in that jigsaw puzzle, it may take you where you want to go. So it releases the pressure a little bit. It's something that I think everybody accepts. I don't think most people like it, but some people thrive on it. That's for sure. But when you're at a big club, a successful club, the pressure becomes a little bit easier until you lose that one game. <laughs> if you win more than you lose, then you're, yeah. you're okay. Absolutely. And, and you know, one, once you are in that position where you've got the role and, and you're established at, at, at that sort of level, how important is it to stay ahead of the game? And obviously a lot of, of press interest and you've got huge fan bases in all the clubs you've worked for. You know, what, what is it that, that you can do as, as a manager, as a coach, as a member of staff to stay ahead of the game, liaising with, with those industries, but keeping true to yourself and your beliefs of yourself and the club and what you're trying to do? Yeah, I think that I think what you said there is, is is staying true to yourself. You are what you are as a coach. You know, there's no if you are a certain type of person, then stick to that way of being. Because yeah. if you try to be something else or somebody else, it's quite easy to see through that. I think. I think it's that's that's not a good reflection on yourself. And, and believe you me, football players can see through those types of things. If you're yeah. honest up front, if that's your sort of persona then get that out there, you know, get amongst it, get that out there when you're coaching and, and stay, stay true. It is, it, is, it is relative that, to be who you are um, and be accepted for that. And it will work and it won't work. You know, we can't please everybody. Uh, that's, that's the mantra I have. Sometimes you have to please yourself. But it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. Improvement and staying ahead of the game requires a lot of research. A lot of a lot of understanding of like I've said what's going on out there in, in, in the world of, of sport. But also keeping keeping ahead of the game means knowing what your competitors are doing. That's important, you know. Um, what are they up to if you can get that information? Or there's certainly something behind every successful football club, be that an individual or a process or a strategy, or is it great recruitment? You know, all these things play a part, but you have to be, for your position and your football club that you work for, you have to be slightly in front of where you are right now. Because like we said in previous um, parts of this talk, you know, every day is a different day at a football club. It brings different challenges. Players yeah. are all individuals. They have, you know, highs and lows. You know, you can finish the training session at the end of the day and you're really on it and everybody's happy. You can come in the morning, everybody's depressed. All that's happened is they've left your football club, come back in the morning, and a lot of things have gone on in their own lives. Yeah. So you have to rebuild those building blocks straight away. Is a coach always, you know, ahead of what's going on as far as being in a good mood when everybody's flat? What's your mood like? You know, how do you translate that mood? Because if you're in a poor mood all the time, the players are, they'll soon realise this is a bit down, it's a bit dour, it's not working, don't like this. So you've got to appreciate a football club and the football players and their expectations on that day-to-day -day basis. So your mood's got to be good. Regardless of anybody else's, it's got to be on it. And, uh, and that doesn't matter what level you're at. If you're enthusiastic, I think your players can feel that and I think then your enthusiasm will translate to what you're trying to give them and they will then try and carry out those actions and enjoy their training, which is the most important thing, is to enjoy the training and challenge themselves in training to get the best out of them. Brilliant. 
And and you've mentioned, you know, researching and staying ahead of the game and, and as a coach continuing to develop. Are, are there any areas what are really of interest to you in terms of research and development that you've looked at in, in recent years that you think, you know what, that's a key area I'm really I'm really after getting getting more knowledge on. Yeah, I, I quite like the new research into the reality stuff that's out there now. Uh, yeah. it's I think it's ahead of its time. But I think, you know, having been involved with a company in, based in Manchester, then it's, you know, it's progressing. It's progressing really quickly. And it is a tool that can be used within the sports science arena for, for all different reasons. It's being used in medical situations now. So I think players are evolving. They have, you know, video yeah. games. They're, they're on the internet all the time. They want different ways of practice. I think with the VR, it can definitely improve uh, cognitive, cognitive research into how players think and react and you yep. know, when they're injured, how they can get back onto the training pitch quicker by using VR beforehand. But I'm also interested in things of, of how people learn. How do people accept information? It's, that's always been one of those things that's to... I can sit in front of a group of 20 football players and give a team talk and I can, I can express my views on how I want the game playing and I can guarantee every one of those players, and you'll have had this, will look at you and will nod and smile and, and all these things and yeah, they're taking it all in and then you think, they've got it and then five minutes later, they'll ask you a question about something which they haven't understood yeah. but you think they have so they're all receptive in different ways and that is why I'm interested in, you know, is it talking to somebody is it showing somebody on the training ground is it uh visually showing them you know on a screen those types of things because everybody accepts information differently not not everybody in that dressing room is at the same place at that moment in time so there's a lot of skills you've got to learn those skills of how receptive can you be and who you need to talk to and who you don't need to talk to so yeah. i like to think about those things and to try and translate that into good communication, really. Uh, and like I said, if, if I don't know all the answers, which I don't, then I'll try to find out. I'll try to find out what makes that work or how does that work. And then I'll try to translate that to the football players if they've asked me the question. Or I'll introduce them to somebody who probably has better answers than I do. You know, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid to do that. And I don't think coaches should be afraid to be... be um, be, you know, don't spread yourself thinly. Use people. I think it's uh, it's a benefit to everybody. Yeah, and you mentioned that I think at the very start about that open mindedness and, and being open to say, you know what, I'm not sure. I'll find out for you though. Or... And that was that that was one of the the, the things when, when I left Manchester United when Sir Alex Ferguson left. I had that moment of reflection, and there were a lot of things in my head that I was thinking about, but I couldn't actually work on the training ground with because it was intense. It was just 24 seven, move on to the next game. Don't look back, look forward. But then when I discovered, you know, the, the VR and my hyper, the company that are doing it, then it opened my eyes to the fact that that's what I was thinking about, but I didn't know it existed. But it was only when I was out of the game for that period of time, I found it and I, I got involved and the guys there were, were terrific. You know, we, we talked about certain aspects of how do you deliver this, how do you deliver, and they've put thoughts onto paper or into reality for me, and and you know that's that's a blessing in some some ways because we've all as coaches got massive ideas and energy and enthusiasm, but we just sometimes don't know how to put it down on paper or how to get it out there, and we have to learn these skills and ask people how do we do that, you know, and I, I think. Won't be shy is uh, you know be inquisitive. I think that's important. Brilliant. So um, near nearing the end, um, we've got a few questions lined up, Mike. But before we put some questions to you, if that's okay, just to just to let people know we are um, looking for you know voluntary donations for the NHS. I have been notified that we've actually already surpassed our target, which is fantastic. Really appreciate all of the attendees who've contributed to that, and obviously Mike. Uh, on behalf of sensiblesoccer.co.uk for giving his time up um, and, and there are a few minutes left we, we are going to 
um, finish the webinar shortly after we pose Mike a few questions because we're aware at 8 p.m. is is the clap for the NHS. We want to make sure people can can log off and, and do that. But before we do, Mike, we, we have a few questions that have come in, if that's okay to ask you. Yes, carry on. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let, me, let me pull a few of these up. So in, in, uh, in regards to your way of playing and a playing philosophy, um, as a first team manager, do you, do you feel that that change is dependent on the opposition? Or do you just make slight tweaks to ensure you can you keep a consistent message to your players? What what's your approach on that one? Yeah, I think you have a your own philosophy of how you want to coach. I think you build that up over time, and you, you find out through all the things we've talked about today through mistakes, really, what your philosophy is and what you can deliver. From that, I think you you find out what the dynamic is that you're trying to put in there. What is the group dynamic? You know, because when you move from club to club or you get more established and you work with better players, the dynamic is a little bit different. So how do you, how yeah. do you put your message into that dynamic? You know, because believe it or not, coaches can upset that dynamic by, by being individual. So you have to be you know, on board and collective with, with, with what you want to try and do. Um, I think it's really important to, to feel as though you belong with that group. You know, and, and what I mean by that is that group trusts you with their careers, with their, their, the process that you want to put in place will make them better, you know, and make them achieve because they all want to achieve. That's, that's the top and bottom of it. Uh, and it requires different skills. You know, one player can't do it on his own, although you could say and Messi does quite a bit on his own and Cristiano Ronaldo does quite a bit on his own. But in general, one player doesn't make a team. It could be the difference in a team, but there's a collectiveness there that requires you know, everybody to join in. So that's important, of course. And you've got to grow. You know, you've got to grow. You've got to grow as a club. You've got to grow as a, a, a staff. You've got to grow as a, as, a, as, a, as a group of players. So I think that's, that's in the main... I think what I'm trying to say is it's a collaboration of things. You know, it's, it's, everybody's got to to join in and want to go on that journey. You know, I'm a big believer in journeys. It's, it's, it's not a short pit stop. It's something that you want to build on. And when you've been on a journey and it's been successful, you want to share that with, with people, you know, and because it's a great opportunity, it's a great thing to do. Um, and the rewards are good. But it is, uh, it is a collaboration, I think, of everything. Brilliant. Um, a question coming from Matthew here. Um, what what would be your best advice for a twenty year old coach who started coaching men in the game? And, and that that could probably carry on to what would be your best advice for a coach's full stop who want to make an impact in the game. I think um, to to start learning to be a coach is to do as many sessions as you can. Think about what you want to do. Keep it simple. Keep it relative. Um, get out there and be part of that group. You know, offer offer a little bit of insight. Get your drills simple. You know, and then build from your drill. You know, I think it's important to have some sort of connection. Start small and start to grow your sessions a little bit. Add a little bit more detail as you go along. And I think for me, the one thing that I learned quickly was how does your how does your voice come across to people. Because we all have accents, we all have dialects, we all have different ways of expressing ourselves. And sometimes it's a little bit of a shock when you listen to yourself. So you've got to understand the players you're coaching, how they hear your voice. So it's, I think when you're putting on a session, get in there, mix it up a little bit. Don't be rigid. There's no need to be rigid. Be flexible. You know, if it's not working, stop it. Start again. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's nothing in the rule book that says you're going to start at A and finish at Z and it's going to be perfect. It's, it doesn't work like that. So don't be afraid. You know, find your voice. Overcome your nerves a little bit because you will be nervous. I can remember those days when I'm nervous and I'm still nervous now when I stand in front of a load of players who know everything about the game. But I think it's important you find yourself and get out coaching. Coach at any level you can. Get out there, whether it's kids, because they're all been different demands. Fantastic. So, 
Um, there's, there's so many questions coming in, Mike, and, and we've got very, very little time left, unfortunately. Um, what I will say to the attendees is obviously we're, we're hoping to develop this relationship with Mike and with sensiblesoccer.co.uk and the coachingmanual.com. So um, finally, from, from me, Mike, obviously, uh, and for, on behalf of the coaching manual, a massive thank you for giving up your time and obviously... Um, a big shout out to sensiblesoccer.co.uk and you can follow them on Twitter at SoccerLTD. Um, Mike, any, any final words from yourself in terms of, of the current climate and, and coaching and, and what we can do moving forward? Well, I think in the present situation, you know, everybody's, like I say, reflecting on, on, on what the future is going to hold. I think we have to be conscious of the fact that there will be changes. There'll be changes in, in every walk of life, I think, going forward. I think we need, to, um, we need to understand where we are right now and where we want to go as, as human beings, really, not just coaches. I know that when we go back as a group of players to Manchester United and a group of staff, we'll be excited again. Excitement's great. It's like a new start over, even though we're coming towards the end of the season. So we need to just think a little bit more clearly, respect respect what we're doing, respect the people around us and really enjoy life. You know what I mean? It's, it's a serious game, football, but we can make it less serious by smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I think people buy into that, you know, and, and let's entertain people. Professional sport is about entertainment, you know, not, not necessarily for the individual who's participating in it, but certainly the people that are paying to watch, it's an entertainment sport. So, Give them as much entertainment as you can. Find ways of doing that. Brilliant. Um, Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to talk to you and thank you so much for your time. And, and obviously, the coachingmanual.com and sensiblesoccer.co.uk, I keep plugging. Massive thank you to everyone who's attended the webinar um, today. And a huge, huge, huge thank you to everyone who, who made that voluntary donation to our fantastic NHS. Great work being done across the country and obviously professional clubs like Manchester United as well and their appreciation to the NHS um, alongside other professional clubs across the, across the country really. So massive, massive thank you um, and we hope to might have you on again and really appreciate your time. The recording, the webinar recording will be on the coaching manual. Um, dot com as well so anyone who does miss it or wants to rerun it and we hope to have you back on um, a webinar in the near future Mike and thank you for your time you're welcome you're welcome you're brilliant welcome. thanks Mike thank you everyone for joining and stay safe and thank you be safe